Hello everyone and uh, welcome to tonight's live stream. Um, I was sorry for the delay. Um, we were trying to get um, Adam's uh, webcam working and unfortunately we couldn't get it working. So um, all you're going to be able to experience is his dulcet tones um, and uh, not his face this evening, but that's fine. Um, so uh, before we start um, tonight's live stream, I just want to say, uh, just mention up top, I do have a new video out and if you want to watch it, um, like four days or even five days before it's going to be on YouTube, you can sign up to my Patreon for one pound a month and uh, you can um, experience uh, the joys of my new video. Anyway, um, so my guest this week is a true renaissance man of the lunatic fringe, Adam Go Rightly. He is an author, actor, musician and discordian. His writings on Kerry Thornley and Discordianism were used as a source for Adam Curtis's six-part documentary, Can't Get You Out of My Head. He has written extensively on ufology with works such as A is for Adamski, The Golden Age of UFO Contactees, which he co-wrote with Greg Bishop, and the excellent Sources, Spooks and Kooks, which I have right here. It's kind of like a well-worn copy as well, as you can see. I also like scrawled in, in this uh, copy of the book as well. Um, you also might recognise him from the 2019 movie The Hill and the Hole, where he played the role of Roger Person, a psychopathic cult leader with a heart of gold. And tonight he joins me to traverse the wilderness of UFO disinformation. So please welcome tonight's guest without a webcam, Adam Go Rightly. Hey, thanks for having Hi. me. So, so, so sorry about the webcam thing, but damn it. It's here fine. we are. <laughs> it's fine. And you showed me your excellent background as well so, uh, earlier on. Now uh, your interesting um, little office setup. So, yeah. Uh, it's a shame that we can't get that experienced <laughs> on camera. But anyway, it's it's fine. It's technical difficulties. What are you going to do? So um, thank you for joining me um, tonight. How are you doing? I am doing pretty good. It's kind of been a long day and I'm a little bit spacey, but, you know, maybe that'll make the show <laughs> unique. <laughs> That's good I'm, to I'm know. Da I'm down in some... Uh, coffee here and uh nice good to go what time is it for you it is uh four o'clock out here in central oh. california nice nice <laughs> where we've just for some crazy reason had the two coldest days of the year and actually got snow where i'm at oh really <laughs> yeah almost a foot of uh snow it got down to 23 degrees <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, it's just this weird uh, cold spill that came through here. Then uh, tomorrow it warms up, and by uh, Tuesday we're going to be in the 70s for the foreseeable future. So this is kind of a weird deal. That yeah, happened. it's really. I feel like there's weird weather going on all over the place. It's very bizarre. I was, I was actually going to say at the beginning of this show, um, if I cut out at any point, there are extreme winds here. So okay. Thankfully, uh, well, hopefully, um, my internet um, stays in place. So I wanted to bring you on tonight because not only um, have you written an, an excellent book on, on UFO disinformation, but I just think you're, you're an excellent researcher. And I wanted to talk about um, specifically like UFO disinformation um, and specifically about your book, Sources, Speaks and Cooks, um, which... I think is one of the best books written on on not just UFO disinformation, but also kind of like the community that surrounds the world of UFOs. It kind of reminded me of um, have you ever read uh, Confessions of a Grey Robin, Robin Ufologist by James Mosley? Oh Lord, yes, I love that book. Love yeah, it's kind of, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of kind of similar to that. It, it, it's kind of a very personal look, um, mm -hmm. and especially because you've had a lot of um, uh, interactions with these people yourself, it kind of gives a, a bit of like a, a kind of personal um, tinge to the whole story. Yeah, you get kind of uh, 
you know, behind the scenes, backstage uh, <laughs> pass to what's going on with some of these characters in the field. Absolutely. So the, before we get into that, I'm going to do, you know, like general questions up front um, mm -hmm. and kind of like the first, the, the questions that I tend to ask every single person um, so far in this live stream series that I've been doing, which is um, also one that you've probably been, probably been asked a million times. Um, but what drew you to kind of fringe topics like ufology in the first place? Um, I think uh, I always had an, uh, pretty early on affinity or if I felt like there was like a natural talent to be a writer. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, that being good at something like that, it takes a lot of work and practice. And I felt I put in a lot of time, but that uh like when i was in my uh, mid teens i started writing lyrical poetry work some friends of mine were in a band so back in that period i was writing uh, lyrics of a kind of uh, tolkienish nature you know the fantasy realms that type of uh, stuff so I, I i was into that during the that period also, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, of course. That was a mind a classic. Blowing. Yeah, for, <laughs> I guess it was 78 it came uh, out. So, yeah, About I was that, yeah. right in my wheelhouse. So, all that uh, was going on, and I had a... Uh, psychedelic ufo experience i've told about many 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 times so See, that, this was on this was also on my list of questions oh, to uh, okay. talk about your psychedelic ufo experience you want to go into that now or later absolutely let's go into it if okay. it's it's part of it's part of you know one of the things that drew you into this topic in the first place mm -hmm. i think it's a good good kind of way into ufology so it's kind of funny i was um this was in high school, and I was in a creative writing class. And say I was, I was probably 17. And I wrote this kind of uh, hoax uh, story for the creative writing class of having a UFO encounter. And I guess it was pretty good. The teacher believed it, you know. And I remember afterwards, I was with some friends and I was reading it out loud to him and they were laughing and other people were going, that crazy stoner dude, you know. <laughs> but it was like I set myself up. Once again, it always seems like planting the seeds for these type of things. Mm -hmm. And it was probably a year after that that I had an actual UFO experience, quote unquote, with a, a friend. And this was back in my stoner days when we were experimenting with a lot of things and uh, what year was this that was 1978 so oh, i'm so like this is like this is like true, like <laughs> dazed and confused vibes <laughs> oh <laughs> totally you know and uh, that movie itself is exactly the scene i was kind of living in uh, nice. during that period he captures it in that movie you had the uh stoners and he had the jocks and you kind of had <laughs> the people who moved in between that so and you had the kagers out in the uh out in the country somewhere so yeah <laughs> that yeah, was he tapped into was that a richard link latter film uh -huh. yep yeah see he tapped into a lot of like strange resonances like those films have a real kind of like very they feel very real his mm -hmm. movies dazed and confused there's uh what's it uh slacker it's the other one slacker, uh, yeah it's got the one that had alex jones in as well hasn't he mm -hmm. <laughs> so dazed and confused totally captured <laughs> kind of my teenage years and uh the high school so yeah imagine that kind of scene then we're at a party one night and we uh dropped this acid that was going around then and they uh, the guy who was selling it said, be careful with this stuff. It's been double dipped, whatever. <laughs> so we're coming on to it. Myself and a friend took it. Uh, and it started getting heavy at this, uh, it was this party house we'd always go to. And we said, we got to get out of here, man. It's just too intense. <laughs> too much noise, too much chaos. Let's get outside and go for a walk. And we're kind of in suburbia there. And we thought, well, where can we walk to? Let's go to, to, the, to the levee, the ditch bank. We can kind of get away from things. And I swear to God, as we were getting uh, 
cl- you know, close to the ditch bank, I go, uh, you know, what if we saw a UFO right now? You know, nobody fucking believe this. And we both started laughing our asses off, kind of imagining that. This sounds, yeah, the stories always sounds totally crazy, but got on the ditch bank, watched, walked for a few minutes and saw our first UFO. Um, but, what did it like try and explain it like well they were they were all like your classic ufos right like a it, kind of flying saucer type yeah it started out with the flying saucer there was a cigar shaped thing uh they got increasingly bizarre like it was a cartoon you know like mm-hmm. there seemed to be a um, communication going on with whatever was there you know you hear the trickster thing it was like mm-hmm. it was it was playing with us and my friend i had a he's still a good friend we have a symbiotic kind of uh, simpatico going on with each other we we've written a lot of music together you know and you have all those telepath i had that thing going on with him ahead of time you know so that might have accounted for part of that experience um Let's see. So the first UFO was so intense. I remember I fell to one knee and my buddy helped me up. And so as we're seeing this stuff, we're talking to each other. You seeing that? It's a saucer. What? Yeah. It, you know, and the, the cigar shaped and it got increasingly ridiculous what these things looked at. There was a multicolored uh, or this one ship with a multicolored propeller and uh, there's a total of like seven or eight different crafts we saw as we're walking along the levee. And then the last thing we saw was like a uh, shooting star that was coming down. Then it stopped uh, midway in the sky and poof, disappeared. Gosh. And, and so we're kind of at that end of the levee. We turn around and walk back. And... Uh, so that was the last UFO we saw. But when we got back to the uh, place where we saw the first UFO, we were like maybe 50 yards away from that. And uh, there was a beam that came down from the sky and it seemed to be uh, pointed down on the area where we fall, saw the first UFO. I couldn't we couldn't see where the beam was emanating from. So you're both experiencing this and seeing mm-hmm. it at the same time. Yeah. Like, like you're do- confirming to each other, like, are you seeing that? Yeah. Yeah. And I've always called it a dual hallucination. But, you know, I don't know how much was going on that we were influencing each other. Mm. To, uh, you know, it's just hard to tell this, lo- uh, you know, that long ago. I mean, we still talk about it now and we both remember it. Th- kind of the same way but you know was there some other something going on with our brains where there might have been some telepathic thing going on to you know where we were creating some you know, a mass hysteria between two people i don't know <laughs> oh it's just like crazy to, what like a kind of folly ado type scenario that you're both <laughs> <laughs> what what you call that a folly ado like shared uh, i can't mm-hmm. i can't remember exactly what it's what it's what it yeah. means it's like shared, a, a shared delusion between two people basically yeah. and I, I not that it was a delusion i guess it's more of a trip well yeah who knows i don't even i have no clue at this point but um mm. um i'd done plenty of psychedelics uh <laughs> we never had to experience anything at all like that i you know you've seen kind of mild hallucinations like lighting effects or you're outside and vegetation seems to be moving around like in a crazy way but (laughs) nothing like this yeah ufo thing that uh we experienced together back then and so yeah (laughs) <laughs> that's this quite a wild story because then I guess it makes you think like I'm not I don't necessarily believe that every single person that is uh, seeing UFOs in the sky is tripping out mm-hmm. but it makes you wonder like how much of that is um it, it is something that's coming from maybe like a brain chemical or something like that yeah you know? that's what I kind of guess what was going on I had all these mm-hmm. after that happened I had all these theories you know when uh, Immediately afterwards, I was convinced we saw aliens, you know. 
<laughs> and I was trying to spread the word. Nice. And my friend was going, I don't, I don't know, Adam. I don't know, you know, what we saw. Then uh, time went by and then he started believing, well, yeah, maybe it was aliens by then. I wasn't so sure. I was reading other books, uh, for instance. For a while, I got into all those biblical books about UFOs, how they're demons or whatever. So kind of <laughs> warped my mind on that. And then uh, the um, John Keel book uh, about he talked about the super spectrum and how he said that people who go into meditative states or maybe you can do this on drugs, you can turn mm -hmm. into a sort of a frequency uh, that appealed to me, that type of thought, and that we were in some window space where uh, we kind of tuned into that frequency and could see something that some type of energy, you know, that's uh, maybe always there and kind of the Hume, Hume, Carl Hume thing where we're kind mm -hmm. of helping to create these type of archetypes or whatever. Um, for what, yeah, I was into pretty heavy conspiracy stuff at one point, you know, and uh, the idea, well, yeah, maybe like a Martin Cannon's controller <laughs> scenario was going My on. My favorite. There. Yeah. <laughs> but I, now, I, now, I, no, on. I think it was just some uh, effect of our brains uh, producing all of this. All I've been a kind of creative visual person, so that probably helped too. Mm -hmm. That we we put ourselves, well, the drugs kind of put us in a trance-like state, you know, yeah. kind of hypnotized us. I don't know. Yeah. So yeah, I've always been too too nervous, too anxious, anxiously inclined to ever dabble with anything like that. Yeah, I feel you're like probably I, wise. <laughs> I prob I feel like I would I would be like the real unlucky one that would do that would do a, a, some form of psychedelic and then just end up losing my mind, and, well, and would never ne yeah. never get it back. Yeah, there's well, I mean, yeah, it's happened to a lot of uh, creative people or intuitive. Uh, people that are more kind of uh, quote unquote psychic or mm. you know more tuned into stuff that those psychedelics are this too much they turn up their senses uh, and they get and it's happened to you know quite a people like when I wrote about uh, Carrie Thornley I think that was part of uh, what led to his uh, paranoid schizophrenia not only you know did he have um, a predisposition predisposition in his family on top of that uh, drugs and other weird uh, things that happened in his life so yeah some people shouldn't miss with those things but uh, so yeah talking about the background that influenced me that cr anything <laughs> we got, so, we so got that after that what was your kind of first um how would I phrase it? Like kind of your first foray into into more kind of like the world of ufology. So like actually being involved in research, meeting people, that kind of thing, like immersing mm -hmm. yourself in that world. So I had written this uh, thing called, uh, what did I call it? Were the uh, early UFO contactees, ritual magicians. It was kind of based on this, UFO experience. I was saying before when we got to the uh, ditch bank and I go, what if, what if we saw some UFOs right now? Nobody would believe us. And it was like what I was entertaining then is we had planted some seeds. Perhaps we were it was an unconscious ritual or we were unwitting ritual magicians. So I had written that uh, article and I started writing other things about uh, UFOs. And I'm thinking i reached out there was a conference in uh, joshua tree area called we saw i saw advertised called uh, uh retro ufo well that sounds fun yeah and it was <laughs> and uh, i got to know the lady who put that on so i started trying to i was interested in networking to find out about all these other people in ufology so i actually you know spoke at one of the uh, retro ufos my buddy greg bishop was out there i already knew 
uh, Greg. And so I started looking at maybe attending other um, UFO. Well, what year are we talking about in this? That, that was the mid-2000s. Right. And I was thinking a good example of a UFO uh, conference and give you a kind of a behind the scenes look at it was, uh, oh, yeah, it was the 2007 Roswell. Uh, that was like the 50th, 60th anniversary. Um, and uh, a guy named Guy Malone, who had been at Retro UFO, saw my little talk there. And he said, well, yeah, I'm going to be doing some of the organizing at uh, the uh, – Roswell uh, conference, you know, which is a big deal every 10 years. This was the 60th anniversary. So they really put on a big show. And so we, you know, I said, I can, I can get, uh, I'd like to have you come and speak at that, put on, do the same uh, presentation. And so, yeah, sound great. I was going, I knew Greg Bishop. I knew through Greg, Nick Redfern. Mm -hmm. And so we were all going to that and we ended up uh, basically sharing a room together. That's often what they'll do. They'll <laughs> put you. So we're, we're hanging. Those were all buddies of mine, but I didn't know, I wasn't going to know a lot of the other folks there. I had heard of them. They, you know, starting to become aware of the big names or the guys who've been around for a while, the Stanton Friedmans, the Bruce McAfee, for instance. Yeah. And uh, that year they were there was two venues. There was at the U, uh, Roswell UFO Museum, where some of the those more famous or the mainstream guys, like once again Stanton Friedman, some others were there. Then Guy Malone had set up this uh, venue that was in this. Uh, it's almost like a nice theater kind of space there, where some of the more kind of off the beaten track <laughs> presenters. Myself, Greg, uh, Nick Redfern had a kind of, it seemed controversial, his thing on the, uh, the uh, he did on the Roswell book where he said, I forget the title of it, but part of the premise was that it was an experimentation the Japanese did or somebody else that were using, right. yeah, I forget what the name of it. So you, you had these kind of two uh, different camps working uh, there. And, uh, so anyway, we get there the first day, uh, we're staying at some, uh, hotel and we go in for the morning breakfast, you know, continental breakfast, get some, uh, cornflakes and soggy bacon and <laughs> coffee. Don't, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so like, I, I don't really stay in hotel rooms that often. Uh -huh. I stayed in a hotel where it was like a best Western mm -hmm. in uh, the middle of nowhere, West Virginia. And I got so excited about, <laughs> about like, cause I, I, cause I was like, there's a coffee machine. We get an intercon <laughs> we get a continental breakfast in the morning. Look at this massive bed. All, the, co like, all the coffee you can drink. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it was it's the worst usually... coffee I'd ever have in my usually life. pretty bad right yeah, yeah <laughs> but it's like it's now a running joke with uh, me and my boyfriend it's like mm. uh the, the best western i'm i'm a massive fan you know I just, <laughs> I just i don't usually go to hotels so you know when when you go to one i'm like i love it anyway That's carry an experience. on experience it is so so yeah we're going down for our breakfast and uh uh look who's there you know we sit down and it's uh Stan Friedman and Bruce Maccabee, and we're all sitting down with them. We're not talking UFOs. We're just what, something. It seemed like there was something going on in the country up on CNN. So we were watching, talking about that politics or whatever that event was. And there was another guy there who I didn't know, and he was the chatty one. And he started going off about UFO disclosure and how uh, this, this was 27 to so uh, 28 was going to, 2008 was going to be the year of uh, disclosure with Hillary because she was running wow. for president and she was going to be the disclosure candidate. And he <laughs> mentioned John Podesta. People knew John Podesta had some interest. And he's going on and on. And I'm like, going, most of us are this like, you know, we just had our first cup of coffee, man. This guy's pretty intense, whoever he is. Uh, <laughs> So we get up and go, and I'm leaving with uh, Nick and Greg, and I go, who who the hell was, <laughs> was that guy? Does he really believe all that? He said, 
oh yeah that's uh stephen bassett he you know he, he he's totally <laughs> oh, gosh he t- he totally believed all he's telling you you know yeah okay yeah so <laughs> So at the end of this conference, they had what they called the disclosure debate back in that uh, like theater oh. space area where they brought in all the speakers. And there was like 20 speakers, you know, we're mm-hmm. all supposed to get up on stage. Maybe it was more like uh, not quite 20, maybe 16 speakers. And they're going to de- have the disclosure debate. Once again, a lot of this was new to me. I didn't know exactly what was going on in ufology, what they're debating, what this mm-hmm. was all about. A big term back then was exopolitics. You ever heard mm. that one? Oh, I'm very familiar with the word okay. of exopolitics. I didn't really I didn't <laughs> Too really familiar. Know, <laughs> didn't really know what that was either, but because I had my own little thing I was into about uh magic rit- rituals and UFOs that I was presenting. But uh, so they got into the d- debate and Turns out Bassett was the kind of star of the show there. He was the big moving force that everybody was interested to hear from that time because he's lobbying for disclosure. And he started talking about how, you know, once this happens, we'll have we'll be able to back engineer all this craft and we'll have free energy and pe- you know, people's uh, power bills will be nothing and it'll be a utopia. Yeah, I was going. Wow, these guys are really into <laughs> this stuff. And uh, I just remember this because he pulled out a paper. You know, he's kind of holding court, and he pulled out this paper uh, the uh, with the Washington Post. It was kind of a write up of the uh, Roswell event, and then they said on the first day, uh, Bassett pointed this out. There was one presentation called where the early UFO ab, uh, contactees ritual magicians. And I don't think he even knew who I was, but he's saying, this is the stuff they're focusing on basically saying this crazy stuff here <laughs> when they, we could, you know, we really need to have the government uh, is kind of minimizing what, and I didn't really, <laughs> didn't really matter to me one way or he's another. He's making you out to be the crazy guy. Mm-hmm. But I don't. I don't even think he knew who I was that I delivered that speech. But mm-hmm. he felt me, and uh, so that was kind of basically that experience. Another funny thing was so we're going back. They give you uh, different vans and stuff, driving us back to Albuquerque. There is a small airport in Roswell, but you're, most people are flying out of Albuquerque, which is a big hub there. And I got a. Uh, my cell phone had been out of range and came back on. It was a producer for the Laura Ingram. You know who she is? Laura Ingram. Laura Ingram. Is she a news reporter? She's on Fox News now. Yes. She has yeah, one of it. those talking heads shows where it's very yeah. right-wing craziness stuff. But she, yeah. <laughs> she had a national radio show at that point. They must have seen my name in the Washington post and somehow got my phone number and wanted to be, me to be on the show that day and it was too late i didn't get back to them in time which was probably a good thing because they probably wanted to get some ufo wackos on there just to <laughs> make fun of them and I, I could hear her probably saying so you firmly believe that aliens are visiting our planet and i went went un- no not not really what i was doing <laughs> i was just talking about some theories that possibly blah 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 they probably would okay they probably just wanted a little sound <laughs> bite yeah yeah or they wanted to hear some crazy <laughs> person yeah. could make uh fun well, of that's so typical. and they can yeah. usually find that quite easily with them um, with people in the ufo ufo world so that, that's kind of a uh, overview of that conference they have a parade every year so yeah at some point i'm gonna get i have been to roswell um i went there once briefly about nearly 10 years ago um Mm -hmm. i want i want to go back and i want to go to like a a conference but i feel like i'd be um shunned if i walk through (laughs) the door people people would be like get out of here (laughs) i know where you're coming from um well I i was gonna say uh greg and i were you know since we were speakers uh we 
they put us on uh, the parade card. So we sat up there and waved to everybody and threw out <laughs> trinkets and stuff. I'm sure nobody knew <laughs> who we are, you know. <laughs> so it was a uh, good time. And they give you, um, we got like little uh, uh, stubs where we could go to different uh, restaurants, you know, that would pay for our food and maybe a couple drinks. So you had the scene where a lot of the speakers were hanging out and interacting and talking with each other. So, yeah, you know, that was that was a good experience kind of a good overview of a uh, ufo conference so were you involved more in like kind of like the more kind of conspiracy um circles before kind of dipping your your toe into the ufo waters mm -hmm. right. yeah and that came through a lot of the uh, during the zine period that was going on yeah, see, I want to know more about that because you, mm -hmm. you, it, it seems like you, you and and a few other people that I talked to were around for this like really interesting pre-internet kind of conspiracy era where a lot of information and you write about this a little bit in Sources, Spooks and Kooks, um, that it was, um, and I wrote this in a question that people would kind of like share. Um, these what you say in the book in the book at the time were like rare documents so you mentioned like mm -hmm. um, the gemstone files the mj12 documents you also mentioned alternative three which i spent a year of my life <laughs> making a two and a half hour documentary on drove me crazy yeah and how those how like um the documentary is kind of about how because it was not very available um, you couldn't like easily kind of for want of a better word like debunk it as being like a, 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 a actual production instead of a real um, documentary that kind of proliferated more conspiracy theories mm -hmm. but like tell me a bit more about what that era was like so if you can <laughs> yeah um I was thinking, you know, so I'd given you some of the background, my UFO experience or whatever. In the uh, early uh, 80s, say I was in my early 20s, I remember uh, it seemed like the initial experience that got me in the JFK assassination. I was at a community college and I saw a poster that said, uh, did the CIA kill JFK? Question mark. I went, whoa. <laughs> I'd never heard that one before. What's going? So I got interested in this totally went really deep, deep, deep into the Kennedy assassination. So I was interested in the conspiracy theory stuff too. I was a science fiction fan, uh, became a huge Philip K. Dick fan, familiar with uh, his work. Yep. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I mean, really, before he became well known, I had gotten the bug and uh, found all his old books. And th there's a weird paranoia conspiracy angle to his all st stuff, uh, alternate alternative dimensions. So, yeah, I was into all this stuff. Started writing. I tried to write fiction, working on different stuff. And, uh, entertained some good ideas but never really kind of got there as far as producing anything and so we're moving into the uh, 80s and i started picking up on the zine movement and i was of course into all this stuff ufos paranormal uh conspiracy uh, theories and uh that's where a lot of that writing started to uh show up it, it was it became a uh, platform or some place for uh, people who are into that stuff to uh, basically produce that type of material there there wasn't a lot of uh, outlets or what like i said there wasn't the internet and this kind of started uh really got going up uh, the zine movement in the uh mid 80s or so it, it was you know also a venue for uh, punk rock music magazines mm -hmm. and uh, psychedelic research and you know you had the xerox machines were becoming uh, much more available then so you could produce stuff e uh, more easily and cheaply so this 
became an outlet for all these kind of you could say even marginalized people to some extent the early hackers uh all had their kind of niches emerging from this, this um, zine scene. And so there was a, uh, mag a zine that came out called Fact Sheet 5, which I was amazing. You heard of that? The uh, I don't think so. Yeah, the I guy who pu published it was Mike Gunderloy. And what he did was every month he reviewed – maybe it was quarterly it was put out hundreds of zines you know it became right. this great resource fact sheet five and so somehow i found out about that then going through that i saw all these zines about conspiracies ufos i mean some of the names you'll know jim keith for instance he had a yeah. zine back then and there was the publishers who started publishing this stuff illuminate press with ron bonds he published a lot of jim key stuff uh, my friend ken thomas steam shovel press that started he was doing that in the early 90s and he put i started sending stuff out you know and oh people want to publish my stuff um greg bishop had a great scene called the excluded middle that looked mm -hmm. at all these intersections between paranormal psychedelics conspiracy it was kind of a hip hipster <laughs> kind of a hip thing to it you know the cool kids yeah. the uh, and um so yeah made all these connections i forget what she uh, uh on in rare documents so you could find a lot of these documents they talked about in magazines in different places are you familiar with may brussel yes very familiar okay <laughs> So I uh, found out about her at some point, too, and you could get her old uh, cassette tapes. I think she died around 80. For, for people that don't know, though, because I'm just very conscious that sometimes I get comments and, and, and I, sometimes because a lot of us know about these kinds of stuff, but some people watching mm -hmm. might not know. And I don't know if you've ever watched Norm MacDonald, but he's got a great bit where uh, when he used to do his podcast, and he'd be like, tell the folks at home, explain it to the folks at home. So that's what I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to do to you and ask you to kind of tell people who May Brussel was. So she lived in uh, Carmel, California, in central California on the coast. there, a pretty beautiful place. And uh, what the hell she came, she came from money. I mm. forget. Uh, some uh, her father was um. If I've got this somewhere because I mentioned I can't remember it off the top of my head, but I mentioned her in a video, and I'm sure I'll get it at some point. Um, uh, I'm sure I'll remember it when I'm not <laughs> <laughs> trying to remember it, but <laughs> um. Yes, her father um, was a well-respected rabbi um, called Edgar Magnum. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay, and there was definitely th there was some money in the uh, Magnum family, or whatever the name was, right? Yeah, I believe so. They were definitely affluent, and she travelled a lot. Like when she was younger, she travelled to quite a lot of places. And um, she was quite, yeah, she was quite. Um, well known. There's like one, um, I think it's like a Playboy magazine piece on her that like calls her like a Beverly Hills housewife. <laughs> like, I, I, would, I wouldn't go that far. She, nowadays no. she's seen, or at least she was seen by my group of people like the mother, the matriarch of conspiracy theory. She showed people how to do she was an obsessive newspaper clipper you know and gathered all yeah. this information together she really cut her teeth on the kennedy assassination and became known for that she was kind of the first one to start saying that watergate and the uh, kennedy assassination were investigated uh, uh, excuse me, were connected, and mm -hmm. she at some point started doing a uh, radio show where every week uh, 
She would just uh, run through all the various clippings she came across and started putting all these things together. And yes, she started talking about alternative three at one point. One interesting, <laughs> one interesting note with her is that it seemed like she was kind of a bored housewife or something, or she raised her kids. And so this became her passion, her mm. outlet. And she had had these this massive collection of files just heavily doing her weekly show at one point she had an affair maybe for many years with the writer henry miller kind of controversial writer author of uh probably her tropic of cancer and other books so there's that angle somebody i heard there was a play being produced about uh, may brussels life oh, a few years back and um uh, so that's she, where I. They, they would. Re, she'd record her radio shows as well and send them out in tapes. Mm -hmm. And you can actually listen to if you go on. You're on YouTube now if you're watching this, um. But you can search on YouTube, um, for I think it's like May Brussels, the May Brussels Project or May Brussels Archive, and they pretty much have the entirety of all of her shows, and they're all separated out into playlists, um, by year. It's crazy how many there are. Yeah, I, I've seen that. And I think, you know, at the time, 80s, 90s, you really couldn't get all those. And you could actually send, I remember sending away for some of her uh, cassette tapes then and mm -hmm. get them. Um, and in that, I, yeah, that's the first time uh, with me, I'd heard of Alternative 3. Mm -hmm. And she treated it like a really believable <laughs> story, you know, at that time. Yeah, and I think I, I kind of give her a little bit of grace on that just because of how, number one, how it was promoted. And I think a lot of people also don't account for the book version as well, which came out, which mm -hmm. um, purported itself to be totally nonfiction. Um, and then there were all of these conspiracy rumors going around about the book. Oh, that it's been suppressed, or you can't get it in here. There was a whole warehouse full yeah. of books, and and it, you know, all of this, all of these, they're all junk stories. Like they weren't, it wasn't real. It was all market employees to get people to buy more copies of the book. Um, but like with all of that going round, like she was she did kind of get not like I don't want to say suckered into it, and maybe I'm a little bit too like um forgiving because i do like her but i feel mm -hmm. like it, it it was kind of it, i don't necessarily think that alternative three was like a psyop or official disinformation mm -hmm. but there was definitely an element of like behind the scenes but especially with the publishing house that they wanted to they knew that they could sell more book copies if they put it as non-fiction and that's yeah. what they did and then it just took on an absolute life of its own. And she was also interested in it because of um, who's the guy, O'Neill, with the O'Neill cylinder. And this, you know, this very kind of real idea, especially nowadays, I guess, with this idea of um, the rich and powerful escaping the planet and, you mm -hmm. know, leaving leaving all of us proles uh, on, on the planet mm -hmm. to die while they fuck off somewhere else hey, i mean man. she wasn't she wasn't necessarily wrong about that you know when you <laughs> sounds about. totally feasible yeah um, exactly so it's like it it, it again kind of it, it's like layers and that's that's the thing with a lot of these stories they work because they take kernels of truth right like yeah. to get a, to get a really good um kind of conspiracy theory and i say like you know like for things like kind of alternative three which we know are, are fiction um and things like montauk as well they work and get people to believe in it because they take these little things that are true um mm -hmm. and that makes the story um even more swallowable that's how it works that's how <laughs> that's dense information 101 yeah. um with the alternative three, then yeah, and I uh, so yeah, I heard May talking about it, and I got a hold of the book at some point, and I thought, yeah, this is going to be hard to get a copy, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but wow, I did find a copy of Alternative Three. <laughs> then I s finally saw the video, and I think I got it through uh, Bill Cooper of all people. <laughs> oh, really? He, yeah. See, yeah, he Bill he Cooper. he was obsessed with it. He it's in it's in um. 
behold a power horse mm -hmm. been referenced and he's, in he's he started uh pirating all these different a few videos and one of them was alternative three which he was selling then i actually sat down and watched it and i go what the hell is this lame stuff this this is <laughs> obviously you know uh, fi a fictional account you know it's kind of yeah but uh yeah and so there's and there's a lot of those rare documents another one may brussel uh talked about was the gemstone file mm -hmm. i think that's probably where i first heard about it from was through her also the Tor torbit document mm -hmm. nomenclature of a assassination cabal mm -hmm. and i was able to get a hold of documents like that through that the whole zine network um and um may talked about uh this jim garrison guy and different uh his investigation to the kennedy assassination uh bringing all these people into it uh david ferry and mm -hmm. clay shaw and all this whole thing and i thought wow this is amazing and uh you know to me, it lent a lot of weight at that time because this guy's the New Orleans district attorney. And yeah, you know, he really must have been on to something. And he was kind of embraced by the uh, counterculture of that period yeah. as well. And of course, it ended up, a lot of that ended up in the Oliver Stone movie, JFK. But mm -hmm. uh, since it's a great then, movie. Yeah, but, you know, there was a, <laughs> much was wrong about what Garrison uh, presented, <laughs> perhaps everything. So we don't need to get into all of that. So <laughs> once again, you know, May Russell, who I really liked and respected to some level, pushed a lot of nonsense, whether knowingly or unknowingly. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of part of... Um... I, I mean, I even see it with researchers that I that I usually I, I like and respect that there, there will always kind of be a a bit of a blind spot, right? I'll mm -hmm. find a researcher and I'm like, oh my god, like we're we're kind of like vibing. Um yeah. And, and then it kind of goes south mm -hmm. at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kind of like, you know, used to um used to that happening at this point. Yep. with them with researchers especially in like conspiracy and like ufo topics getting back to the mm -hmm. the ufo topic yeah um, even though i know it's what even though i know well it's, well it's all kind of linked in everything's kind of linked and overlapping it's like especially in the conspiracy world but i wanted to ask you what kind of made you want to write sources spooks and kooks um I had heard about, uh, you know, you're talking about the MJ-12 and those documents. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're getting into a period where there's there's the zines, but now we're getting into the early time of the Internet, and there was like uh, the bulletin boards. And that's yeah. where a lot of these documents were ending up, like the John Lear thingamajiggy whatever he called that the lear document or the lear statement yeah, the Le lear report whatever <laughs> yeah <he called. laughs> and it started uh, a lot of that was uh showing up on that early internet i wasn't really quite involved with it then but then you'd see mm -hmm. this stuff repit reprinted in some of the zines you know so that's where i started coming across the mj12 documents and dulce material and, all this stuff and I kind of took it in at the time. I didn't quite know what to make of it. It seemed like MJ 12 was uh, really out there and different people were talking about it. You didn't know for sure, but yeah, like you said, there must be something at the core of this, some factual element. These look to be authentic documents. And I, there was a story about Roswell and they get mentioned all these things feed into each other. So if you hear this stuff enough, you know, at least you, you're willing to entertain the possibility of these things and they get ingrained in culture more with the X files and that type of stuff. So all of that was in my uh, background and 
you know, I moved on to other things. I was writing about uh, Carrie Thornley and Discordianism and all that. It didn't really leave the uh, subject of UFOs, but, you know, how your interests kind of wax and wane sometimes. So anyway, yeah. I write about meeting uh, Tal Levesque in the book. And uh, that got me uh, once again interested in the uh, looking into the Dulce base uh, story. Mm -hmm. Tal had been somebody uh, around for years and the name. It was, I don't know if I need to go to all the details about how we uh, met, but I kind of, it was one of those names you had heard over the years that seemed to be involved in all kinds of stuff, UFOs and dating back. Uh, to Richard Shaver, he actually knew met Richard Shaver back in the day, and had all so these. Let's, let's, I'm so sorry to stop you, but I just mm -hmm. want to do and explain it for the for the people that are listening who might have no idea who Tal Levesque is <laughs> and no idea who Richard Shaver is. So, if if you don't mind giving us a very brief kind of overview to the person to the person that sat at home going, "Who the bloody hell are these?" People? I know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh richard shaver uh really he became known through uh, amazing stories magazine in the mid 1940s and uh, up to that point amazing stories had been pretty much a straight science fiction magazine edited by this guy ray uh, palmer and they had a letter section to the magazine where people would write in they got this kind of wild letter from this guy, uh, Richard Shaver, who wrote in. He did discovered this ancient language called, was it Mantog? Mm. And he, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if he talked about his arc welder at that point, but he worked like in a naval shipyard as a welder and started hearing uh, voices uh, over his arc welder talking to him. First, the voices of his co-workers, but then later they got more weird and diabolical and he began to believe that there was these entities called the Deros that lived uh, under the earth that were tormenting us humans. And there's a, this big backstory that uh, Taver, uh, Shaver learned through, uh, he, he learned to in, how to read this ancient Montauk uh, alphabet and learn right. the true history <laughs> going back hundreds of thousands of years about space aliens that had come here, lived here a long time. And there was some type, there's different versions of the story, but maybe some atomic explosion or something kind of sounds like the Lemuria story. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the space people got in their ships and took off and those who are left behind were the Duros who uh, they couldn't handle the sun rays. It weirded them out. They went underground and became these crazy guys who were tormenting the earthlings with beams and stuff. And there's also some good guys that are the Duros who have good beams that are battling the Duros and uh, Shaver uh, wrote a series of stories kind of based upon this theme and, um, expanding upon it and they were presented as true stories you know so there was this big fan club that grew around him and also people who since this was a true story some people started believing it was a real thing and mm -hmm. had their own experience and started writing into amazing stories and it became this phenomenon really became popular for a number of years became known as the Shaver Mysteries. So that's in the uh, 40s, and uh, Tal Levesque grew up, and he was a Shaver Mysteries fan. And so he had that in his background. In the uh, 70s, he and his wife at that time started a zine called The Hollow Hassle. His wife was, what was her name? Mary, uh, I forget her last name, but... Um, Mary story. And uh, so Tal was involved in that, that kind of uh, just interest in paranormal research and whatnot and the inner earth mysteries and uh, UFOs as that scene started to evolve there into the uh, 70s. and uh, Which is kind of like the, the peak <laughs> of all this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. 1917s. And so... Um, 
he got a hold of me in a kind of roundabout way, and I didn't really know who he was, and I started learning who he was, and he was we started talking about the Dulce Bass story and how he said when, he was mm -hmm. when you say in a roundabout way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I write about it in a in the book. I got this uh email and it didn't have his name on it. There was just the email address of Questal at whatever uh, and uh, he said he was working on a show called, uh, trying to pitch a show called Mariposa Mysteries or something about, that's a, that's a mountain town about uh, 30 miles from me. It's where the mm -hmm. gold country started. And uh, it's kind of an old, uh, like, settler's town. It's still, the town itself still has that vibe in some of the old buildings, you know. There's a lot of interest and stuff that goes on there. But anyway, he was pitching this paranormal series. And he said he had also been a source for a re recent episode of uh, UFO Hunters on underground bases. Right. But he didn't say his name. I said, well, that's interesting. Uh, okay. I was going. Uh, oh, and he's, he was hitting me up for some reason. He heard about me somewhere if I had any ideas of paranormal stuff going on in my neck of the woods. And so I knew Bill Burns from UFO Hunters. And before I wanted to talk to this guy, I wanted to find out, you know, if he was legit, he really helped out with, or if it's just some, you know. And uh, I contacted, actually, I knew Nancy Burns better, asked her, and she got a hold of Bill, and she said, oh, yeah, he's legit. He knows things. Oh. And... <laughs> <laughs> And so we got together, and th that's probably the more humorous chapter in that book called My Breakfast with Tal, where I met with him and Jim Ro uh, John Rhodes, and they laid all this crazy stuff about reptilians, underground bases. There's reptilians there in uh, Mariposa as well. Um, and uh, so... And really, that's how the book started. I was going to write like a 10,000-word article called My Breakfast with Tal, with just recounted <laughs> that crazy uh, breakfast. It's pretty fun. And You mentioned you mention in that that there was um, some sort of photographer, like someone took a photo of you, and you were oh, like yeah. wondering, you were wondering whether or not it was like Tal Levesque <laughs> had organized it. To make yeah. you feel like maybe you're being watched, or maybe they were being watched, or something like that. Well, yeah, I was kind of—I wouldn't say paranoid, but I, you know, I was meeting this, these guys for breakfast. What am I getting in here? Do you know? And I asked him, "Well, how how will I know uh, what you look like when I see you?" And he said, "Just look for the guy who looks like a narc." You know, oh, so okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I get there, and they're just. By, you know, after a couple hours, my brain was just spilling out of my ears with all this stuff. I, you know, you <laughs> can handle, only handle so much of this. And um, then uh, we we're getting close to leaving. There was a flash, like somebody took a uh, photo, you know. And I remember I looked around, they looked around and said, Oh, that was interesting. I wonder what the hell that was. And they, you know, they're nodding. Yes, that was interesting. <laughs> like somebody. <laughs> And uh, so, uh, yeah, and I remember Tal got up and went to the bathroom and I was talking with John Rhodes there. And I said, wow, man, a lot of his stuff sounds like uh, Richard Shaver. And he goes, and John Rhodes told me then, oh, yeah, Tal uh, knew Richard Shaver back in the day. And it seemed like Tal knew a lot of people. Uh, Dan Aykroyd comes into the uh, story. <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna ask you about that, but just on Tal for mm -hmm. for a moment, because oh, I, yeah. um, when I was talking to Steve Bay a couple of weeks ago, I can't remember who it was, but someone in the chat said that he worked at at Tal previously worked at Northrop Grumman. Have you had that before? I don't know uh, for sure because he was always kind of. of I wouldn't say evasive. I don't know if I ever asked him flat out, but he did work at some govern or some installations as a security guard, either right. government installations or you know private 
companies that did contract work with the government. And supposedly at one of those places was where he came across after hours in the uh, dumpster. It, you know, it seemed like maybe it was Rand Corporation, but he came across all those uh, famous Rand blueprints of these underground, underground tunnel boring machines and all that stuff that kind of fed into the Dulce story. There was a guy who put out the book. What was his name? Uh, about underground bases with all the blueprints of these boring machines. And I think he got that material from uh, Tal Levesque. But uh, so that's Tal kind of uh, got into the subject through that by coming across these secret documents or documents that Rand didn't want people to know. But then he also uh, had an experience with a reptilian in 1979 in <laughs> Uh, Santa Fe showed up in his room uh, one night and Tal had the, these these uh, murder board type maps he had that showed it, it was putting that showed uh, entrances to underground bases in the southwest and also where cattle mutilations were at and other types of activities and you can see some of those maps on the <laughs> on the web if you uh, look around. So Tal said he had that hanging on his wall one night when he woke up and this uh, reptilian was there st standing in his room peering at this map. The, uh, oh, reptil so the, repti <laughs> the reptilian <laughs> was uh, buck naked except for a uh, utility belt he had on with a you know Star Trek type uh, phaser. And <laughs> wow. And... <laughs> He said that uh, that time, you know, Tal was uh, freaked out at first. What the hell is going on? And uh, seemed like he picked something up and threw it at the alien, but it went right through his body like he wasn't totally, uh, totally material, you know. Fuck and uh, <laughs> and hey, they started to sleep again. <laughs> and they started this conversation where this alien he calls them thought bubbles right into Tal's head that expanded his consciousness and just downloaded tons and tons of information that kind of got him. <laughs> that's all part of the uh, Tal story. Um, Name. So pretty, pretty wild. Let's um go back just to a, a backtrack a little bit because he's a bit of a, a, a complicated character i just want mm -hmm. to touch on on his relationship with dan Aykroyd. is that mm. something that's like that is confirmed like there was they definitely had mm. some form of working relationship because wasn't well, it like that like he, he had something to do with like the house of blues or something <laughs> well <laughs> it is par it is partially confirmed mm. i know for a fact that uh tell uh, Levesque was good friends with Peter Aykroyd, who is Dan's right. Dan Aykroyd's brother. He's passed passed away. Who has been involved with uh, he, Peter Aykroyd? I think also was an actor, and him and Dan been involved in different projects. I I know people, friends of mine, who saw Tal and Peter Aykroyd together at different uh events and things so there's definitely that connection there but what he told me the reason he ended up in uh, mariposa before that he'd been in like i said he lived in santa fe new mexico then los angeles in the uh, 80s 90s and somehow he ended up in mariposa and he said the reason he had been sent there is that he was sent kind of like an advance man by Dan Aykroyd to check out the uh, area and see if it would be a good venue for a house, future House of Blues that, that Dan, <laughs> you're laughing, Dan Aykroyd wanted to open there. And uh, what they were concerned about was that uh, you know how the future Earth changes, California is going to get flooded, but some areas... Uh, Mariposa is uh, something that supposedly will survive and will be an island. Right. And also, 
So another feature that they were looking for that had underground caverns where they could have a shuttle system from wherever Ackroyd planned to set up his base of operations to their house of blues. <laughs> now, all this part, it might have been Tal's idea. but he, I don't know. I, I, I can envision that Dan Ackroyd would, would be all about this. Not only has he got like, he's got multiple like UFO shows. He also has like, didn't he have his crystal skull? tequila well, yeah. or something like that he's very into into this this and, kind of uh, um this kind of stuff tell told me he had worked as a producer for a show called the sci factor by Ackroyd. that was supposedly not supposedly it was uh produced in canada i've never really watched it but he said he was uh somebody who uh you know basically helped produce, come up with ideas, was like a source for information on UFOs and aliens, etc. So he right. claimed he had that background as well. So the House of Blues never happened, but uh, that's where how Tal ended up there. And uh, I have tried reaching out to uh, Dan Ackerley before. I never had any success. I would be curious what he... <laughs> It would be. I would love yeah. to know. Mm -hmm. Get get it confirmed from the horse's mouth. In fact, um, I I have uh, a friend who was friends with Lorraine Newman, and from what I heard, L Lorraine tried to uh, see if he would talk to us, but he uh, wasn't interested. You know, but he probably gets all kinds of offers from people. Those mm -hmm. guys at that level are kind of hard hard to get through to. I think we yeah. tried to. Drop the name of Tal of Vest to him, but <laughs> maybe then he was like, absolutely not. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it definitely won't sort of see. So um how <sighs> trying to think of about how to pose this question because the Dulcie story is gargantuan and mm -hmm. um I've covered it a, a very small part of it on this channel, the real like very basic origins of Dulcie, i.e. the um, late 1970s cattle mutilations at the Gomez Ranch, the Rommel Report, the 1979 Albuquerque Conference, the Tau Saucer story, just just that kind of stuff leading mm -hmm. up into the, the Paul Benowitz affair. Mm -hmm. Before we kind of go into the main Dulcie story, just to continue on the topic of, of Tau Levesque, how does Tau fit into the Dulce story? So, uh, how to approach this? Um, it's hard, right? Because it's such a <laughs> like, massive well, web of nonsense. Well, this to touch on the uh, Benowitz affair, Benowitz was sending out these letters to different uh, politicians like U.S., uh, Senator for uh, New Mexico, Pete Domenici was his name, and also yeah. the the other guy uh, who put on the cattle mute uh, conference. See, so many names. Harrison Sh Harrison, Harrison Schmidt. Yeah, and he also I heard letters went to Ronald Reagan, who was president at that time. And I think one of the letters to Domenici, and I'm sure you've seen this, and I might have might have published it in the book. I'm not sure, but you did, and I I I, I reference um the book as um being oh what is it that you say in the book that it was in one of the letters that he sent out that it was the first time this idea of like a war or a firefight mm -hmm. and what he place. what he said or what was said initially was that i think there was 66 people it didn't really say necessarily they were killed but they abandoned the base right and so that, that's what Benowitz said. There's some other interesting uh, stuff out. But uh, so that's kind of where it seems it started, at least with the, the Dulce War thing. So that was like 82 and a number of years passed until the, the Dulce paper showed up. And what that was, it's like uh, eight pages, and it basically says – there was this uh, security guard by the name of Thomas Castello who was uh, at this event where 
now it's 66 people died. There was a revolt. You know, there was a secret treaty between the um, military and the aliens uh, in ex exchange for, uh, uh, you know, information about uh, their secret technologies. We'd let them do what they wish to do with the uh, human abductees and that all this all these hybrid experimentation, human alien hybrids, and they were consuming uh, some of the stories. The uh... Some of it's kind of like downright horrific as well. When they talk about that's, isn't that where kind of the story about like the different levels of Dulce underground base come mm -hmm. from? You know, like on it's... one level, you've got like genetic mutations. The other one, you've got like humans that are alive in glass cages and all, like it just gets horrifying. Yeah, and this is stuff, some of those images come out of the uh, Shaver Mysteries. There's a lot of crazy stuff like that, you know, that, that the Duros were doing. They were abducting women and doing uh, perverted acts and stuff on them with weird machine, you know, machinery. And this, you know, sounds quite similar to uh, the Dulce thing. Mm. So where were we? I was, oh, so the, the, these Dulce papers, uh, come out one of these crazy documents and talks about once again thomas costello was a whistleblower to all this stuff uh going on there he uh, was part of this battle it's now called the dulce war where 66 humans were killed or whatever and he got out with um, security footage uh, mm -hmm. um, photos he brought out his flash gun that could vaporize uh <laughs> people and aliens and uh he uh, made a bunch of copies of these documents and send them out to uh, different researchers and um, they supposedly ended up in the hands of this lady named cherry hinkle and so yeah one page tells that basic story about thomas castello then there's these hand drawings of the uh, aliens and different uh, levels of dulce and the vats with the human alien hybrids etc cetera, etc cetera. that kind of started the uh dulce story as it turns out talavesque had a huge hand in crafting that uh, narrative it might be initial story 90 percent of his for all i know because he and uh, cherry hinkle were friends at that time and he later told me that he finally admitted after years and years that he basically kind of cooked that up with uh, Cherry Hinkle, and there's a connection made there with John Lear. And John right. Lear tells the story that uh, he kind of retraced the drawings, or who knows for sure. But anyway, that once that document uh, got out there, that really pushed the narrative of this you know, story about uh, the Dulce secret underground base. So Cherry Hinkle, she was from Nevada, right? Same mm -hmm. as John Lear. So, yeah. do, and you said there's, there was a connection between John Lear and Cherry Hinkle. Do you okay. think that? Did, go, like maybe elaborate elaborate on that a little bit more. And well, again, for, for people that don't know who John Lear is, he kind of came onto the scene late 1980s. Um, as all of this UFO disinformation is starting to kind of spill over into like the into more kind of popular culture, I guess he kind of comes on the scene along with Bill Cooper, and they are both kind of pushing this very, um, very kind of like sinister and malevolent version of ufology. Mm -hmm. Like up until that point, it had still been kind of you kind of had like your crashed sources, um, with with Leo Stringfield the Roswell story was kind of becoming prominent throughout the eighties, but it was really kind of when John Lear appeared on the scene that it starts to take on this real kind of sinister, um, sinister kind of element to it. He's the mm -hmm. son of, um, I've forgotten his dad's name, but his dad created the Lear jet. Um, it was kind of the, I, I call him the Nepo baby of ufology. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So he kind of, he kind of comes on and he also, spread a lot of disinformation himself admitted oh. some mm -hmm. of it yeah he came on the scene uh in the mid 80s and i uh, i know you've i think you've interviewed uh christian lambright yes 
but uh, I don't know if you covered this in your in your interview, but uh, according to Lambright, uh, he was Lambright was a player with different groups at that time, and uh, Lear this kind of showed up all of a sudden. He knew somebody, knew somebody, and he uh, so he start he had an interest in uh, ufology, and he went started going to some of these initial conferences in the mid 80s also flew flew planes for the cia mm -hmm. should probably probably throw that in there as well. <laughs> and um he had, it was like he came out of nowhere he hadn't been involved in this long and all of a sudden there was a conference in uh, 85 where uh, bill moore was up and talking about the uh, mj12 MJ-12 papers and the group MJ-12. And during that uh, speech, John Lear said, uh, stood up, raised his hand. I know all, all about MJ-12, blah, 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 blah. blah. And it's like, whoa, it kind of freaked people out. You know, all of a sudden he, be, and all of a sudden he became kind of a big thing. He, you know, had the Nepo baby. He had the, uh, background there that okay this guy's he's this pilot and all this and his yeah. dad invented the lear jet and, the and people, in, people in ufology if you get some credentials behind you like oh look at who, look who his dad is oh he's got all of these these connections this person's vouching for him it's like they fall head over heels for it you see yeah, it time and time again christian lambright is a very smart guy but too he was going oh wow okay interesting and um and so he got more involved in stuff. And, uh, uh, oh, I was going to mention was that uh, Crestone uh, conference. Mm. There was this conference. It was really more like a kind of get together with some of the uh, these people in ufology, a dozen or so who knew each other and were networking. David Perkins and uh, Tom Adams and... Mm -hmm. uh, They'd been involved in a lot of the mutilation UFO research. Linda Howe was friends with them. Christian Lambright, a few others. They would get together maybe once a year in some place and this talk about the state of ufology and also partying, whatever. And kind of this these get-togethers and it uh, this one John Lear entered into the mix and. Uh, he showed up and he was trying to control the uh, kind of the narrative or he wanted to shape the narrative ufology. And he came up with this thing that uh, for want of a better uh, term, it was called the, uh, or we referred to it, David Perkins and I as the Crestone Manifesto. He, he put together this thing that kind of basically outlined a lot of these emerging things that, came out of the Benowitz affair, even though people, some of these people knew Benowitz, but th that story people weren't aware of then, you know, once again, that there was underground bases, that the aliens were definitely involved in mutilations and that they had yeah, taken over the space, basically that there was an alien invasion. Mm -hmm. And the Lear came up with this paper and he wanted everybody to sign it and the agree to it and they're going to put it put out this statement i think what they were pe anyway people lambright and perkins said uh, no, it's getting a, you don't really want to do that you know and he, I, lear was kind of miffed about it and he kind of left that conference in a huff with uh, uh linda Howe, and all of a sudden they were going to talk to uh clifford stone and uh Major Ernest Edwards, who was involved in the Benowitz affair, and also yeah. eventually to talk to Benowitz. So that seemed to be kind of the driving uh, force was to learn everything Benowitz knew. And, uh, you know, that was all part of this narrative, this story that uh, John Lear was uh, pushing during that uh, period. And I think that what was calling that manifesto basically became the Lear statement, which mm -hmm. laid out all this craziness and became a major theme in ufo ufology at that point in the uh, late 1980s. And, uh, and uh, um, Lear did 
afterwards, not long after that, went and talked to uh, Paul Benowitz. And something happened at that meeting mm. that really uh, finished Benowitz's career. He was really ticked about whatever went on with John Lear. It was like uh, John Lear had made some promises or something. This is this was Christian Lambright's perception of it, that uh, like um, basically Lear had made promises to him that he could really get his story out there in the public domain. And he uh, was Lambright's uh, impression that uh, mm. basically that Lear just took the material and left his left him hanging. And after that, uh, Benowitz pretty much got out of ufology for good and that uh, in essence, Lear had cannibalized a lot of the thing. And he might have, from what I've seen, might have ended up with some of uh, Benowitz's materials as well. Do, what, what's your kind of personal take on John Lear? Like motivations, that kind of thing. Oh, he wanted to be uh, UFO famous for some reason. Uh <laughs> Was he? Uh, was this part of a disinformation campaign? Uh, could have been. You know, he does have that uh, background as a CIA pilot, and uh, some of that crosses over with uh, Doty's time, maybe uh, working for certain. It gets pretty uh, muddled. So on the on the one hand, it, yeah, you yeah. have. And but you know, Lear was a big promoter of a lot of these guys. Basically, he brought Bob Lazar to the attention of George Net George Knapp and mm -hmm. others, and they were using some of these th same themes, memes, these tropes, stories about uh, similar to Dulce War that happened to Area Fifty One and back engineered craft and all this. Um, and Lear was a big promoter of once again the the Dulce base story and the Dulce uh, the Dulce papers. It's it's kind of scary, I think, for me looking back at my childhood was all X Files, right? Like I was a massive X Files mm -hmm. nerd when I was a kid, and it is kind of disturbing now, um, being like in a position of actually like doing research on it that all of those stories that i loved as a kid basically mm -hmm. came out of a government disinformation campaign mm -hmm. like it's quite, well it's quite unnerving yeah. you know? part of part of it is you don't know how much though you don't know uh Obviously, some of it did, but how much of it was just uh, Doty running off and doing this rogue thing on his own, which he has continued to do over these years. Obviously, at the time with Benowitz, they wanted to find out what he knew, what photographs, uh, motion, you know, uh, motion picture footage he was talking. He was intercepting signals uh, with from these secret projects going on at uh, Kirtland. So obviously the government had an interest in knowing what he had, he, he had accessed and try to confuse him, point him in a different direction. Which when uh, you think about it, it's quite, it is quite insane because Paul Benowitz was, f f he's always described as, Mum was very patriotic. His house um, basically overlooked Kirtland Air Force Base. He had um, his own business, Funder Scientific, which was basically, wasn't it like almost at the entrance of Kirtland Air Force Base as well? Like it, it, is, very... it, it, it is. I've been there. It's right at the entrance, one of the entrances, yeah. yeah. He had a lot I mean... of government contracts. Like this was a man who... And, and people have said this before. It's like if if someone had come to him and said to him, "Paul, you've picked up on something, you know," it, and we we can't disclose this for any sort of um, you know national security reason or anything like that, that um he would have complied with that. 
right? Like he, the, his, his, his kind of um, personality would, would would indicate that he wouldn't he wouldn't have like become like a whistleblower or anything. He would have been mm -hmm. like, okay, cool, you know. Well, he was already. Uh, I mean, he'd been involved in ufology for a while before mm -hmm. that. He was already steeped in this stuff, and boy. Not long after they had their initial meetings with him, he had gone well over the edge in believing that, yeah, there was an alien invasion. They were attacking him at his house with his wife, and he brought mm. Myrna Hansen there, and it was a full-blown war. So I don't know how it got from point A to point B mm. so fast or if he had already gone on, started going off the deep end before even the military started uh, military intelligence started first started contacting him, you know, mm. so uh, Myrna Hansen's also a very um, important part of the Dulcie story. She's, she is like, along with, with Paul Benowitz is kind of the origin. Well, and also the, you know, the things that were actually happening in Dulcie, like the cattle mutilations, mm -hmm. but she is very much like in terms of like an underground base story, she's pretty much like the first um, person that says it. Right. I, yeah, I believe so. Um, so who, who is, who is Myrna Hansen for people that don't know? As the story goes, um, this is in May of 1980. Uh, in late 79, around Christmas is when Benowitz started foamy, uh, photographing and filming uh, stuff at uh, Kirtland and got in contact with, uh, you know, what security at the base there started having meetings. <clears throat> And so he, he had already started his so-called, what do you whatever you want to call it, his Kirtland investigation, what he believed were UFOs there. So one one thing, <laughs> one thing that's interesting, if he, you've seen Bill Moore's uh, MUFON speech. Yeah. Okay, of course you have. <laughs> A lot of people say, well, the Benowitz affair started when he was uh, photographing and filming those things in late 1979. Moore makes the interesting comment where he says the Benowitz affairs started in May of 1979 with Myrna Hansen. Of course, it was 1980 mm -hmm. in May of 1980, which I always found that kind of interesting that he said that kind of mixed up the date there for some reason. He, and he's saying it didn't start with the film and the photographs. It started with the Myrna Hansen affair. Weird. Now, Myrna Hansen, yeah, uh, 19, uh, May of 1980, near Eagle Nest, uh, New Mexico, which is near Cimarron, New Mexico, I guess, uh, saw a, a spaceship. She was driving with her son, Sean, I think his name is. They uh, saw a cow being sucked up into the ship on like a Star Trek uh, styled tractor beam. They each got transported up into the ship. They, uh, she witnessed, I believe, a cow being dissected up there inside the ship. And uh, I'm not sure at that time, but uh, she, she got regressed later and she was had these. Uh, different medical experiments performed on her. Maybe it happened on this ship. I don't remember exactly now. But anyway, that was the initial experience, seeing the cow dissected in the uh, ship and her and her son being beamed up there. So she went to the cops in Cimarron. Uh, she'd been described as uh, hysterical at the time. The cops there didn't know what to do. They knew Gabe Valdez, who was the go-to guy for cattle mutilations and crazy shit going out on in the desert there. Uh, Gabe Valdez came and picked her up and for some reason uh, decided to take her to Paul Benowitz, who had contacts with APRO, Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, I think it was called. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. big uh, UFO group. And uh, Benowitz uh, had, uh, he was part of APRO, so he had, he knew uh, Leo Sprinkle, who was pretty, getting to be a pretty pretty famous uh, uh, hip, uh, alien abduction, hypnotic uh, regressor guy at that point. Yeah. So they took uh, Myrna Hansen to his house, uh, ostensibly to do these uh, regressions, and Leo Sprinkle conducted uh, the initial uh, ones and discovered the, as the story evolved, there were several hypnotic regressions that she claimed she had been uh, taken to an underground base. You know, there was the medical experiments. At one point, she had broke free and was going through uh, area of which appeared to be an underground base where she saw the vats with the human alien hybrids, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. That's kind when, of. When I spoke to Richard Dyson, <laughs> which, which is like the, 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 the kind of a disclaimer, um, mm-hmm. you know, it, this comes from Richard Doty. He, sp- he, he spun a wonderful yarn of yeah. how, um, Kirtland Air Force uh, base, AFOSI, very interested in Myrna Hansen because what she described was actually one of the underground, underground like nu- nuclear underground parts mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. at Kirtland. And he claims that they courted her. They, He says that they paid for an apartment for her and her son. They bought them a car paid for groceries they did hypnotic regressions um okay. with them and then also did like lie detector tests on them whilst they were being hypnotically regressed mm-hmm. I, <laughs> i've heard i've heard uh, pieces of that uh, story we do know that uh, uh it's called the monsanto uh, facility mm. You can see it if you go to Paul Benowitz's, you can go to Paul Benowitz's house and you can see how the gate is where Paul Benowitz did live. The gate itself is just, uh, it's not far. You could, in a couple minutes, you could walk to the gate and you can look out on Monsanto Mountain where there is an underground facility mm-hmm. where, you know, at one time they kept all these, uh, one of the, I've heard the biggest stockpile of uh, nu- nuclear components and weapons mm-hmm. in the uh, U.S. Um, and so, you know, you do have some type of facility there. And Paul Benowitz uh, said that uh, the uh, U.S. was, or the uh, folks at Kirtland was helping him with the Myrna, Ban- Myrna Hansen case, and they assisted in uh, him in taking uh, X-rays or CAT scans. So they had taken her somewhere. Yeah, that's true. And what Dodie said, they had a concern with her because what she ended up saying in the hypnotic regressions identified one of these underground facilities. Mm. So what it what might have been going on there, where they were trying to confuse her to make her think that where she had been taken at Kirtland was actually the Dulce base. And Do- mm-hmm. Doty has said that the Air Force had their own teams of hypnotists. To, so there was some uh, involvement there with uh, uh, the Air Force, I guess, uh, helping to take these x-rays and things, you know, it's hard to tell where the you know fiction uh, you know where the non-fiction in and the fantasy begins with this whole uh, story uh, Absolutely. one thing inter- interesting about uh, Myrna Hansen I'd never really thought about it until I was working on the book and I interviewed Greg Valdez who was Gabe Valdez's son and he basically told me that he thought well Maybe Myrna Hansen was uh, part of the operation. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, you know, that may, makes a hell of a lot of uh, sense. With And remember what I said about Moore kind of saying, well, the operation really began 
with Myrna Hansen. He never said Myrna Hansen was involved with it, but if you kind of try to track down Myrna Hansen, she basically disappeared after that, you know. Mm. Krista Tilton, her book claimed that she talked to Myrna Hansen, but I don't know if I necessarily buy that. And I'm all, I also know that, uh, I mean, if you do a web search for Myrna Hansen, that's a pretty common name. There's some movie starlet yeah. from, from yeah, the 40s yeah, I, <laughs> that will, will show up. <laughs> Recently, I was thinking a lot of the abductees back then used uh, pseudonyms because they didn't want their identity out there in the uh, public domain. Mm -hmm. And you probably know uh, David Rydell, mm -hmm. whose uh, father had a UFO, crazy wild UFO experience. Yeah, and, and Leo, his, didn't Leo Sprinkle hypnotize him like a hundred times or something crazy right. like that? So uh, Leo Sprinkle was involved, and David's been going through all the files there in Wyoming. He's come across some pretty interesting stuff. And one of the things he came across was uh, a list of all the names or a, a name of a bunch of the people he did hypnotic regressions that had their pseudonyms right. and their their real names right. on, on this list. <laughs> and because uh, I had, I had talked to Dave and I brought up the saying, well, we really don't know her name. And he mentioned, oh, yeah. And I'd come across that list, but he came across a lot of stuff. So he didn't copy it and he couldn't tell me what information was there. He said at some uh, other point, if he gets a chance, he'll try to find that list because he's going through. There's like 80 boxes of and um, some of it's not available until 2095 well, i know i talked to him about that as well which is kind of a sketchy you know it's well it's well that's the thing that makes me think about that because i think okay and, and for people that don't know what we're talking about leo sprinkle um is uh well known in in the ufo um field for doing hypnotic regressions and he hypnotically regressed manahans and various other people he claims to have been abducted um he is now deceased and his archive of records is at the university of wyoming right that's, yes that's where it is. yeah um and some of the records are accessible now but some of them are not accessible until 2095. Now I do understand that like there may be some sensitive medical things in that, in which case you could, you can just say, you know, that's, that is what it is. These contain like sensitive details or you could censor them in a way that, that, that they could be almost completely anonymous and just provide, you know, details or I, I mean, I'm, there definitely would be a way to do it is what I'm trying to say. I think that 2095, that basically means that every single person alive and researching today will never, ever, ever have access to that ever. Right. <laughs> which is quite crazy. Like, mm -hmm. do we even know that we're still going to have a planet in 2095? Yeah, and if he's <laughs> pro uh, protecting personal information, whatever, David Rydell has come up with some stuff that... Uh, basically says the opposite. I mean, he came up, uh, Sprinkle said at one point that he had returned anything that belonged to David Rydell's father. I guess his name was Pat McGuire back yeah. to the uh, family and there was nothing in there. But as David got into the uh, files, he found all kinds of stuff, even personal possessions of his, I don't want to blow the whole story for <laughs> David, because he's working on this, but even some of his father's personal papers that should have went right. to the family after his death, and he found a bunch of tape recordings of uh, his dad, Pat McGuire, being uh, hypnotically regressed, and so that's you know that's a lot of the personal information there that he didn't really get. So uh, I think, yeah, maybe a, a lot of a lot of it's about ethics. Um, mm -hmm. do There's you, that ethics thing going on, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's quite yeah. It's very frustrating to know that you know, especially when you think that like something could actually hold, maybe not the key, but it could help you, and it could help un people under better understand a story that is if you're somewhat even somewhat involved in in 
the ufology, you would know about this story. So it's mm. like, and, and people, you know, we still talk about it to this day. People debate it. You know, we're, we're still very, it's somewhat clear on on the on the um, timeline of events, but there are a lot of grey areas still, and stuff like that being available would really help to um, clear up a lot of the grey areas. Yeah, but it might it also should... make people look make make them not look very good. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We should touch on that uh, Leo Sprinkle. You'll see him in uh, Linda Howe's Strange Harvest. Mm regressing a lady by the name of judy doherty yeah and those uh from my understand those regressions started well they at least around night around 1975 i think even before that and according to my friend uh late friend david perkins he was telling me that in her initial regressions she talked about a uh cat being uh i've also a, had this. oh you've heard that <laughs> Adopt, a, abducted uh, mutilated what and over time for some reason that turned into a uh, cattle mutilation mm. and of course that was the kind of template of uh, the myrna hansen episode you know with the uh, ufos being <laughs> involved in this uh cattle mutilation you know so yeah and and judy doherty was um I, I mentioned her very briefly at the end of a video i can't remember exactly what one it was that i mentioned her i think it might be one of the dulcie videos but she has this encounter sees what whatever she sees and then she's hypnotically regressed and she's hypnotically regressed on camera for linda moulton howe's um uh, a strange harvest documentary and isn't there like some I, I don't know the ins and outs of it but that like linda moulton howe wasn't very ethical in her dealings with judy doherty well you could you could say that but it was kind of a thing where that was happening on television programs i know david rydell's father went on some national program and he was uh, regressed on air live <laughs> mm. telling you know being uh, hypnotically regressed talking about his uh, episode so yeah i mean we don't know what what went on if uh, actually judy doherty and whatever signed waivers to <laughs> have those regressions uh, mm -hmm. appear in the uh, film but I want to um, I want to ask uh, theories on on <laughs> two two people mm -hmm. that I tend to mention quite a lot, especially in these live streams. Um, Bill Moore and Jamie Shandera, Shandere, depending Sh on who. Shandere. It is Shandere. Yes, it is. Yeah. Because he's like uh, Steve Berg is kind of obsessed with uh, <laughs> Jamie Chandra. Mm -hmm. Wants to track him down. But what I heard from Doty is that Jamie Chandra um, broke into some sort of military base and claimed that he got dropped there by a UFO. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that one. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what to uh, make of that. Yeah, he's kind of a uh, mystery man. Like you, I probably, you know, started looking, okay, who, what's Jamie Chandra? Does he have any background there you can find in mm. his paper archives or IMDB? Or I really uh, initially didn't come up with a whole heck of a lot. There's one weird thing that he's seen some weird. Uh, schlocky B horror movie, maybe as an extra <laughs> back in the day. I don't know if you came up with that one. The story was that he was like more of a news producer, uh, hard news type of uh, stuff, but there's not a lot of information out there. More recently, I did find one reference to him on newspapers.com that indicated that he had, uh, 
produce some type of a news program or a story mm -hmm. or a news program. But the, yeah, there's not a lot out there. He and Bill Moore started working together because they were going to produce a uh, film on UFOs, which mm -hmm. would basically be this whole kind of MJ-12 uh, cosmic Watergate type stuff. And uh, I think some of the early stuff they filmed ended up in UFO cover-up live. The interviews you see with Falcon and Condor, from what I can tell, that was filmed a few years before that, and they just you injected those snippets into UFO cover-up live, and it's real awkward how, what's his name, uh, the host of the uh, show from... Oh, I can't remember his name. I, what I love about that is all <laughs> the squeaky chairs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so they were working on uh, that deal. And, of course, uh, Chandra was integral to uh, the MJ-12 story. They basically ended up on his doorstep. Maybe it was a way for Doty or more to kind of launder it put it out there mm. uh who knows uh, they stayed active together you know from the late 80s early 90s and then yeah chandere kind of disappeared people wondering what happened to him Doty has these uh crazy stories he told something similar to what he told you he told to uh jimmy church a few mm. years back i didn't know what to uh make at it uh, and um I think I sent you and Steve a recording from uh, uh, Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell, interviewed him in the 90s. That was one of his last uh, things, and I forget exactly what he said on there, but he's in contact with Greg Bishop. Greg was putting out the excluded middle, and he's in L.A. there. He's networking with all these mm -hmm. guys, and at that time, Shandra Ray was claiming that he had basically – learn the truth about the aliens and if Greg could guess what it was he, uh Shandra Ray would confirm that to him but Greg couldn't guess what <laughs> what it was if that makes any sense to you it, sounds, it, it, <laughs> I listened to a, a interview I can't remember what, it, what what interview it was that was with Greg Bishop but he was I think it was one that he I can't even remember but he was talking about how um Bill Moore would make or they they were going out I can't I can't remember what exactly what it's about but it's not verbatim what I'm about to say but mm -hmm. it was along mm -hmm. these lines that Bill Moore would make him guess the names of who Falcon was until mm. and continue guessing until he came up with the name and the name mm -hmm. was Harry Rosicki the one that okay. Bill Moore confirmed that sounds like a similar routine. Um, mm. It sounds like, and and this is the thing that I that I always oscillate between. It sounds like it's either a couple of guys who think they're more important than they actually are, who are mm -hmm. doing this weird kind of spy games vibe, or it's actual spy games type of type of scenario thing going on. Like yeah. that, it, it, that's the thing I kind of think about Bill Moore. I think a lot of people kind of write him off sometimes as um, an opportunist or just in it for money or or any of that. But like he would have been, especially at that time, a very useful asset, right? Because he he was um, was he like a, didn't he have some sort of like Russian language degree? Um, That's correct. Had, Russian history, I think. Russian history. He mm -hmm. had connections with ufologists in Russia or researchers in mm -hmm. Russia, and you know, yes. this is like you know, we're talking about eighties. And I know that there's there's a whole large contingent of people who who desperately want to remove politics from the equation. Mm -hmm. But it's like this entire topic is political, and it's always used for political motives. And that to me is like, you know, he's he he or may seems like um kind of like the perfect asset. Well, that's one of the things that uh, Doty has said on a couple of occasions that kind of made sense. He said that, well, when we contacted Bill Moore, we weren't really interested in the UFO stuff. Mm. 
We were more interested in the contacts that he had in the Soviet Union during that period uh, when he was, and Moore was uh, basically uh, exchanging information or talking to, like, I think uh, the way he characterized it, uh, journalist with maybe Tass or something who was looking into uh, UFOs and maybe some university professor in uh, the Soviet Union that was looking into the subject. Now, I think those are probably the two dudes you see in UFO cover-up live that uh, talk on air. It's weird. They don't give their names. You can't really tra track who these guys are. They, they mm -hmm. say their names, but it, it's not printed out. I remember trying to track the figure out who they were and i never uh could but it makes sense that you know that's what the afosi was looking into that uh more was having these contacts with these folks in russia and saw him as an asset they could use to find out what those guys knew what questions they were asking him you know yeah, and, and to confuse and muddy the waters as well, especially with, mm -hmm. you know, Majestic 12. Just to address this, um, is this Jamie Chandray who's listed as crew on The Devil's Reign? That's the movie I was thinking of, yeah. That is a crazy, because that, <laughs> that, I've seen that movie. And, and uh -huh. Not only does I think, I think, I'm, I really hope I'm right on this and I'm remembering, because <laughs> I remember I watched this movie and it was the last drive-in with Joe Bob Briggs, if you if you know Joe Bob oh, Briggs is. Sure. Um, and he obviously does the movie trivia, right? So he was saying a lot of movie trivia about this movie specifically. And like, like Tana said, mob-produced movie. Also, the William Shatner in that, that isn't that where the Halloween mask comes from in that movie? Because that because it's a Shatner mask. I'm, I'm fairly not, I'm certain sure. it comes from that. And also, that's supposedly the movie where John Travolta got converted to Scientology. Oh wow! <laughs> on set. I, so I vaguely I remember that movie. I remember seeing the advertisements. I don't know if I've ever seen it. And when I saw that, uh, you know, uh, Chandra listed in, in the credits, I was going, "Is this some more BS that they're all laying on us?" You know that. That's the only reference you have for Jamie Chandra. <laughs> yeah, there's the Devil's Rain movie. <laughs> there's a lot of weird stuff about that movie. So that's like uh, my my paranoid conspiracy brain is like going like the the <laughs> the cogs are turning <laughs> over time. <laughs> They're like knowing that. Um. So, um, myself and another researcher found uh, Chandra's phone listing. And uh, my colleague called him up and uh, he said he wasn't interested in talking about UFOs anymore. And that was the end of the conversation. Mm. So his, his number, <laughs> you can find it. I'll tell you offline where he's at, you know, but. Uh, oh, that'd be interesting. Yeah, you could <laughs> give, him, give him a phone call. I'm in the US in a couple of weeks. I can now utilize uh, it not being a long distance phone call and give, give him a call. <laughs> see, see what's Who going knows? on. He, he might be more receptive to you calling him, but um, for Maybe. whatever reason. Who knows? <laughs> you never know. But, no, you know, he's you one of those getting up there in years, too. You know, it's like, ah. Uh... Well, and that's the <laughs> thing as well, because I know that, like, I, I just. Yeah, but, uh, there, there's a lot of um, intentional, I think, vagueness about the, especially the, the a lot of the characters are involved. I don't know whether that's because there there are um, very real nefarious things that are being covered up, and I don't mean aliens. I mean more kind of like, kind of like larger intelligence operations that we're mm -hmm. not hundred percent aware of, um, well, which is why some people want to obscure their involvement. There's that, and there's all the sketchiness around those documents. I mean, did mm -hmm. they even have anything to really do with the government? Was it a bunch of guys just creating this stuff for whatever reasons? And maybe uh, Doty uh, was involved, you know, but it, uh, it was like going a bit rogue again to... Mm -hmm create the story to make himself uh ufo famous i think what uh 
Doty got in trouble for, and the reason he was sent to uh, West Germany, I think, I uh, think is where they uh, sent him, was for a few reasons. Number one, uh, Linda Howell had ident identified him in the uh, press, so it got out there that he was a uh, AFOSI agent involved in mm. with Benowitz. But there's some. There's other evidence that he was uh, leaking uh, material. For instance, he got all those phony hoax documents, but there's also a couple reports that uh, Doty uh, put out that talked about a uh, incident that happened in Kirtland Base. Are you familiar with that, that document? Yeah. yeah. And it's actually Barry Greenwood who was responsible for getting those released. You've heard that story? Mm-hmm. Okay. You can tell about it, but I know it. The people well, watching may, may not. Okay. <laughs> so uh, Greenwood saw this. He, he got a video cassette. It was something on the West Coast that had, you know, a UFO disclosure program. This is way back, you know, 79. Mm -hmm. it, well, early 80s, and a document flashed up on the screen about the sighting at Kirtland Air Force Base, just for a second. Of course, Barry f looked at it and paused the uh, video cassette and was able to get enough numbers uh, from it or s some type of information that led him to put in a FOIA request, and mm -hmm. he tracked down the documents and finally got them the documents themselves didn't exactly match up with what had been put on the television screen because something had been altered a little bit you know so it was those type of shenanigans i think might have got uh, doty into trouble and then some of the documents with i think of all those documents mj12 papers i think of them as like uh, call them the Aquarius papers. It's a bunch of stuff. There's the MJ-12 yeah. stuff. There's these other things about these secret projects with uh, various code names, such as Aquarius, which was a real code name for a secret project, but it didn't have anything to do with the fake papers they were putting out. But it was a, a code name. So I think, I bet there was people in the brass of the military that weren't too happy with him doing that as well. And that might've been kind of a rogue thing on his part too, you know. Majestic was also a name of a, a project Majestic. It was a, a war plan against Soviet okay. Union. Yeah. So from, no. from like 1958 <laughs> or something like that. So what you're saying about disinformation is put, putting out nuggets of little factual information mixed in with a bunch of rubbish you know that's how mm. that uh, game is played exactly and you get a lot of um you know ufologists and, and people like that all, all kind of you know spending their time uh looking at the ufo issue and and meantime you've got all of these other things going on it, it just it, it becomes like a massive confusing web but mm -hmm. th that is what it's supposed to be right wilderness of mirrors it's supposed to be confusing that is its intention so so they they when i say they i don't i hate using that word they because <laughs> it makes it sound like i'm talking about you know like people sat in a dark room stroking like hairless cats you know like it's real kind mm -hmm. of like evil <laughs> kind of thing by they i mean military intelligence right mm -hmm. cia they did their job correctly because they muddied the waters and they completely you know it, for one, I don't want to say destroyed ufology, but kind of got it going on a on a very kind of dark path. This is just my opinion. Mm -hmm. On a on a very kind of dark path. And and you know, all of the interpersonal drama that can be stoked among researchers and, and you know, just it it like like this exactly sleight of hand tricks, you know. Mm -hmm. It's all just yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you were talking about how, yeah, there's some real projects. I remember I was looking into this Aquarius stuff, and on the uh, Black Vault John Greenwald site, I saw some Aquarius mm -hmm. documents. This was several mm -hmm. years ago, so I pulled them up, 
yeah, talk about getting confused. It was like, yeah, this is a project, but I don't even know what I'm reading about here. Yeah. You know, did they have anything to do with, and is it, could they have anything to do? How much time do I need to spend looking at this? Well, and that's the thing is any... that's, <laughs> that's the thing as well. It's like, um, you know, people that are specifically interested in the UFO question aren't going to, and, and you know, the UFO world are not going to be looking at a lot of the geopolitical stuff that is going on mm -hmm. at the time. And I think that's a massive, that's a massive part of this story. It's, you know, all of this is happening during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And it, it it just seems to be, like, like mm -hmm. the people that talk about it just kind of, completely ignore that that's all going on because it's like oh no we don't want to talk about the political thing we just want to mm -hmm. talk about you know our crashed sources and our oh yeah you know, the ebens well it's so so steep in politics now with this mm. disclosure thing and the involvement of congress and these characters that look like who knows what <laughs> the agenda is for they looking yeah. for gov government government contracts to... for some applications to uh, mm. view ufos it's like such a mess yeah i wanted to ask you about uh, more modern ufology specifically kind of kind of um the kind of diana pasolka's um the um uh, chris bledsoe tim taylor because that to me just screams some sort of there is something going on there that's very oh. very similar to this okay <laughs> interested uh, in your opinion <laughs> oh well oh man i don't know a lot of it seems pretty silly to me but uh it part of it it seems uh they're kind of driving this narrative to bring in a lot of uh christian belief in this whole biblical thing into ufology and you've even seen that uh, end up in congress with some of the nuttier congressional members now talking about interdimensional beings uh, i think this all comes from basically this group that's been group it's a, a uh, kind of ad hoc people involved all the way back to hell pooed off with uh, Stanford Research Institute and doing their uh, remote viewing back in the day to Valet and all these other people who at the one hand come across as scientific, but also have this uh, psychic uh, component to uh, UFOs as well, this religious uh, component. And I think uh, there's a connection going back through all these years with the aviary, whoever the heck mm -hmm. they were, Bigelow's group, something that's called the Invisible College, I think is basically all of those dudes with various, various agendas. I'm tossing out a word salad for you here, but I think it's informing what uh, Diane Pazolka and uh, Others are, you know, injecting. This isn't necessarily something new, but uh, and I'm not sure what the motivation is behind all of this. Uh, mm. I don't know. That wasn't much of an answer. It's hard to decipher, though. I just kind of wanted to case your vibe. I'm going to ask you a non-UFO question because I was really interested because you, you mentioned it at, right at the very end of the book um, that you have had a very brief, kind of communication with Ira Einhorn. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm I'm interested like in how that came about and like what you because this was kind of happening in um when he was a fugitive, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. um so for those for those that don't know who Ira Einhorn is or why he was a fugitive, um how would how would you describe Ira I first Einhorn? I first learned about him in a book called the unicorn secret uh mm. what's it called murder in the age of aquarius or something yeah you probably Stephen read it yeah, yeah great great book levy is uh he writes on tech and stuff nowadays really uh does some good stuff and did the first or did the last interview with john lennon 
for Playboy mm -hmm. magazine when Stephen Levy was like 20 years old or something. But I came across that book and like uh, Murder in the Age of Aquarius. Yeah, that sounds like something I'd be interested in. Great book. And so went through it. You learn that uh, I. Reinhorn, um, he was, uh, I think, basically in the late 60s, 70s, some type of graduate student or something at a university in Philadelphia. He was an activist, uh, environmental activist, but also involved in uh, UFOs to a, a certain extent. He got involved with... Andrea Puharic and Puharic had some estate in New York where they were doing psychic experiments. They had children, uh, which is there. which is kind of disturbing, right? You know, like they've mm -hmm. got all these children in the house in Ossining, New York, and they, he yeah. calls them. Doesn't he call them the Gellerings? The star, they're, they're the little star kids. They yeah. do these like psychic experiments on them. A little bit so, weird. Yeah. <laughs> Einhorn was involved in that, and he was, as they say, a founder of the first Earth Day. So he's an environmental activist. He was also a networker. That's mm. where he got uh, known, say, in the with the Invisible College uh, folks. He was into uh, promoting and sharing information about, like Tesla. Uh, you know, uh, secret and suppressed technologies. He had supporters like it, uh, big wigs at AT and T that were providing him some of the early phone network banks of communicating. I don't know if yeah, they were basically like putting out, weren't they? Like putting out his newsletters or something like that. Like they were actively like funding him. Mm -hmm. And so some of it seems like pseudoscience too, you know, with Puharic and those types. So he had these, yeah, these uh, sponsors, people paying for all of this, maybe in some extent uh, supporting his lifestyle. Um, and he was, like I said, also involved in ufology. According to Einhorn, he helped edit um, – uh, Volet's Messengers of Deception. He was working for a publishing company, I guess, helping them publish UFO books. Another interesting story here is that, uh, oh, remind, remind me to get to Bill Moore okay. if I forget that anecdote. So Einhorn, his uh, girlfriend, who was also kind of involved in uh, – some of this UFO activities research with him was discovered in a uh, dead in a steamer trunk at his uh, apartment in Philadelphia. And he was arrested and eventually convicted for her murder. And uh, hmm, this was, we're getting into the mid to late. Yeah, it was in uh, 79, I think around then. And, of course, he uh, claimed he had no knowledge that he had been set up. In later years, he claimed the CIA was somehow involved in it. Oh, yeah, that's, 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 they all like to fall on that, that mm -hmm. thing. Oh, oh, the CIA framed me. The CIA gave me a history of abuse towards women, you know. It's probably important just to just to state, especially it is pointed out in that book, Unicorn Secret. He did have, like, very bizarre behavior extremely mm -hmm. bizarre and there was a pattern of physical abuse with his mm -hmm. uh, girlfriend holly maddox mm -hmm. and she reported that i mean her family knew apparently what was uh going on here but yeah one of those toxic relationships it's, that it's she very, couldn't get away from it, and it's also very like you know wendell stevens likes to do that whole thing about oh i was framed by the cia you of know of course yeah, yeah, and pe people buy into that stuff too. Yeah. But uh, oh, so Bill Moore <laughs> comes briefly into the story when uh, he was promoting uh, the Roswell incident. He was going around the country plugging, and Ira Einhorn had a some type of radio show on the campus at the university where he was at. Not sure what the university is, and I think it's in Philadelphia. And uh, 
Moore showed up that night and, you know, to do the show. And he said, well, Einhorn's gone. He jumped his bill. He was out on bill at that point and basically fled the country. There's the Bill Moore tie-in. Um, Bizarre. Yeah. So let's see what happens next. And you can read about this. I definitely look into Stephen Levy's book. So he, uh, Levy tracked him in the uh, getting into the 80s. Uh, might not remember all the details specifically, but he ended up in Ireland and he was using a false name, changed his appearance or whatever. Somebody figured it out. Interpol was trying to track him down and he vanished again and was basically uh, gone until the late 90s when he resurfaced. I'm not sure how he resurfaced again, but he was basically, you know, it's pretty much known that, uh, yeah, this is I, Ryan Horn. I'm now living in France. He had either girlfriend or wife he was living with at that point. And so I knew all this stuff about Einhorn. I was kind of blown away when he <laughs> resurfaced. I didn't think mm. we'd ever hear from him again. And uh, I had a uh, guy I met. Uh, he was a book dealer in the late 90s, online book dealer. And I ended up uh, like trading books with him and buying some of his uh, books. But at one point, he told me that he uh, sold books to Ira Einhorn. Right. And he gave me his contact information, but don't don't tell anybody you got the contact information. Anyway, I got a hold of Einhorn and I asked him if he wanted to do an interview. He hadn't been interviewed up to that point. Later, he did a big interview with Vanity Fair, but I interviewed him um, through email at that time, and it was an unsatisfactory interview. It's hard to get any, you know. Even if you interviewed him in person, he would dance around answering the tough questions. And uh, maybe there were some interesting things that uh, came out of that interview. I also asked him, you know, once again about uh, his involvement in ufology and Jacques Vallée. Mm -hmm. And once again, it was a written interview. So he'd go off on these things about how, you know, whatever, how great he was, how he. <laughs> yeah. How he Real narcissist vibes. And advanced all this uh, research and yeah. Um, and there was some weirdness with our emails too. It's hard for me to uh, explain this, but it there was one email I that was kind of bounced uh, back that was truncated, and I got the impression that somebody. Uh, uh, somewhere in the government uh, knew that I was contacting with him and kind of bounced mm -hmm. this email message back to me to know that I was in contact with him at this time. Right. Hard, hard to explain. Maybe I'm being overly paranoid. But at that point, they were trying to extradite him back to the U.S., mm -hmm. which after many years they finally did. And he was, I think they... He'd already been convicted, so he was brought back, and they sentenced him to uh, prison where he ended up uh, spending the rest of his life. And I'm starting to forget kind of the details here. I know he commit, tried to commit suicide one time. Oh, he did that quite dramatically, didn't he? Where There's even a video, uh, mm -hmm. so he said Associated Press, where he, but he cuts his neck. Mm-hmm. The man was just uh, or, or another level, like, deranged. I mean, number one, he murdered his girlfriend. Um, but a, a, aside from that, like, a real kind of narcissist. And, I mean, I think Levy does a, does a relatively good job of kind of painting that picture of him. He, in, he would have in, been huge in ufology, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and they would have bought into that story, hook, line, and sinker, you know. Yeah, he's been he's been um, he's been got by the CIA, you know, because that's 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 the line that a lot of um, ufologists who have done criminal, disgusting criminal acts mm -hmm. use um, to then kind of like weasel their way back into the UFO scene 
and they're kind of welcomed yeah. with open arms. Like that uh, Stan Romanek dude. Yeah. You know, okay, yeah, he was saying the same. Yeah, CIA set him up with a bunch yeah, of... exactly. Put photos of children or whatever on his computer. It's terrific. This We're getting, is... getting, getting dark here uh, yeah, <laughs> in the final the moments. There's yeah, another the conspiratorial angle to Einhorn that he was res uh, represented as attorney was uh, Arlen Specter, right. who was the uh, creator of he, Specter was on the uh, Warren Commission, and he supposedly came up with the single bullet theory. Right. And then later, uh, he was a U.S. senator for, I guess, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. You'll see him in like in the 1990s at the, if you see the old Clarence Thomas uh, confirmation hearing, he's there asking questions with uh, Joe Biden, who was the uh, chairman of <laughs> the Senate committee back in the day. Not so sleepy Joe back then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a dark and twisted story with Ira Einhorn. I mean, just the thing about, yeah, probably enough yeah. said. Yeah, quite horrifying. I I, I I found him fascinating, though. I wanted to learn more, you know, about if I could. I don't think I really did. I think, but. I think, uh, yeah, there's definitely, um, you know, his network, people that he was associating with, there's definitely uh, elements there that are um, that are of interest. Or of him on like a personal level, I think, overinflated ego, narcissist, murderer. But I think that the I think that the people around him, who kind of enabled him, mm -hmm. are quite it, that whole angle of it is quite interesting. And I it's think. it's a dangerous tool for somebody. Apparently, he had a lot of charisma, so that's mm -hmm. why he was able. Like when he was uh, in Ireland on the lamb, uh, as I recall, he was being. Uh, he was helped out by the uh, that heiress with the Seagram's family. Is it who, Bronfman? Yeah, who is also, isn't he associated with some sex cult or something here in recent years? But yeah, it's just uh, quite possibly. I'm, I'm, I've read and listened to, I've read um, Unicorn Secret and I listened to, um, program to chill like a three or four part series on Ira Einhorn quite recently which was really really good but the details of it are like gone from my head yeah there's a lot there <laughs> there is a lot um so I don't want to end it on it <laughs> <laughs> like, a, like a dark and um on a dark and uh awful night but um I don't know, do you have anything else that you want to add? I mean, it's been great. I feel like we've been on like a whirlwind tour of like all of these different topics. Yeah, no, it was fun. Uh, thanks. Um, I have a couple projects working on, I'm working on, but I'm sworn to secrecy. So uh, mm, very you've seen, exciting. You've, you've seen some hints I sent you. So <laughs> very exciting projects. Yeah, that are kind of linked in with some of the topics we've been talking about. That's exactly. Those, yeah. those, are, those are all the spoilers that that we'll give away. So um, I, I I've been busy, you know. Uh, there's another book project. These things take a number of years, you know. And I always mm -hmm. feel like uh, I don't want to talk about them too much and just jinx my jinx myself uh, somehow. Can you give us a hint on on the next book? Uh it's in part. There's a UFO angle to it, but it's more like personalities involved right. in the field. A little bit like saucers, spooks, and kooks, but from a uh, different era. But it's not across the, the board a UFO book. That's a little right. one part of it. It's a part of uh, grifting and people creating hoaxes. And yeah, it Ooh, sounds interesting. <laughs> Yeah. This sounds fun. Have you got a, I, um, is this something you're writing at the moment? Yeah. And I would say it's like 90% done. So maybe it'll, should be done in a year. Um, a lot of it, I mean, the bulk of the writing's been done, but kind of to the point where 
There's little research things I need to follow up on to make sure mm -hmm. I cover my uh, bases. Yeah. And then I, I get into editing mode and I, <clears throat> I'm a bit obsessive. It's just like, I'll go, I need, I really need it, you know, professional editor, but uh, I go through it again and again and again <laughs> and again. And it does get better, but. You know, I think, oh, I've got this thing nailed. I've been through it so many times and hand it to somebody else or I'm reading. It's like, okay, there's an <laughs> obvious mistake right there. I think I'm going to publish it myself. That's why that'll it'll take extra time. Publish it myself because basically I want to include a lot of the uh, documentation, you know, where mm -hmm. you can say, okay, this happened here and here here's the letter or here's the right. interview or the fbi documents so right and a lot of publishers don't want an extra hundred pages of, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> but that's frustrating but that's the, i mean i get i get it from a publisher's perspective but from like a, a reader's perspective especially if it, it's non-fiction well that you is wanna, always just so helpful you want to know have. that somebody isn't talking out their uh Exactly. Ass. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you also want to want to have it, you know, if a, a book, which sources of spooks and kooks has been for me, has kind of been like a, a kind of jumping point. Is that the right word? For yeah, your own right. personal research. Yeah, I could see you that want, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, you want those documents handy. I tried to do, I don't know how much time we have, but I tried to, at one point, I have a website called chasing ufos and i was going to set up a saucer spooks and kooks resource page it gets it gets difficult trying to do a web page like that mm -hmm. i don't know how many people actually ended up there i don't know if you've been to that uh, website but i put up uh, some of the uh, documents for instance uh jack brewer came up with well, that's another long story, but he found <laughs> the Phil Schneider for, uh, information. And so I posted that on uh, the Chasing UFOs site. Right. And so it's good to have those source documents when you're talking about the stuff about Phil Schneider, how he was a, it looks like he was a, uh, he had mental problems. He was a self mutilator, this and that. Mm -hmm. the, there's a lot of big uh, people who are big phil schneider believers and even if oh, with yeah. that with those documents and that information they still don't believe you know well oh, it's the fbi saying that well They're exactly to... and it's it's the same thing that you can just fall back on at any point is it oh that's that, that cia disinformation to discredit mm -hmm. a good ufo researcher a, a, pa strong... a patriot <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. how dare you a fingerless Be whistleblower. He smirched this vet veteran of these psychic wars. <laughs> exactly. Oh, it's crazy. Um, where can people find you? I'm gonna leave stuff in the description, but if people want to follow your work, where's the best place that they can follow your work? So for books, go to Amazon. I have an Amazon page. Uh, there's the whole Discordian stuff that probably the last decade I've done a lot, any online writing that's not in books or whatever, is it Historia Discordia, go bunch, down a bunch of rabbit holes there. I have that Chasing UFOs site where, you know, just search for that. Uh, am I forgetting something? Uh, I, put you on, I, put your, I put your Twitter link in as well because you're quite active on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, there's uh, that. Uh, I did a podcast for several years way back when that you can find if you search for Untamed Dimensions. I don't know if you've ever listened to that. There's some crazy I don't think I have listened oh, yeah. to that. <laughs> if you want to, yeah, take an amusing ride down memory lane, uh, there's some good stuff. Uh, I absolutely there. will. So, yeah, I think that's uh, basically it. You talked about the movie I'm in where I play a uh, psychopathic killer with a Which I still haven't seen. I've been <laughs> waiting. To, I've been I've been wanting to see it for ages, but I just haven't gotten around to watching it. I got yeah. all of these things on my list, my to-do <laughs> list. Uh, and I'm like, uh, oh, that film looks like it's going to be up my street. Oh, it's got people in it that I know. Oh, I need to watch that at some point. 
and then called, I just never know what to do. It's called The Hill and the Hole, and you can find it on uh, Prime Video nice. for people who, yeah, do that. I will leave all these links in the description. Adam, thank you so much for your time. This has been a wonderful conversation. I'm going to have to have you on again because I've, I've got like two pages of questions that I don't even think I got to. Um, <laughs> sure, I'm I'm sorry about the video, but I was I was su fine. suspecting that would happen because of for some reason Streamyard. If I've I've streamed on other platforms and it's not an issue, so who knows? Maybe I'll do a Google search and see if anybody else is having this problem. I, That's fine. I, I wasn't intending not to present you a video, but <laughs> it's fine. Voice is fine. Okay. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. And I will um, speak to you soon. Thank you for coming on the show. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for um, watching and um, I will see you all next week. Au revoir.